Um, okay, so today I'm going to talk about my uh, postdoc that I've been doing, so some, some results from that postdoc that I've been doing with uh, Susan Evans at UCL. Um, and this is a project that's trying to resolve some questions about the mechanical role of soft tissues in biomechanics because in biomechanical models, soft tissues are usually the things that we don't include. So we really don't really have a very good understanding of their importance and um, if we should actually be modelling them. So first I just want to go through the other people who are on the project, my collaborators. So Flora up in um, Aberdeen on, in histology and then the large group in Hull working on the biomechanics of these models. Uh, and then at UCL um, with Susan Evans and Nick have been helping with this one um, as well. Oh, what's that? I'll get rid of that. Okay, so um, like I mentioned, with biomechanical models, we often need to simplify these models, of course, because um, they are very, very complex if we don't. And one of the easiest ways to simplify a model is by removing the soft tissues um, or other things that we don't have very good uh, information about the material properties. So we often uh, simplify a model by using one material property for the bone um, or not including sutures, not including soft tissues, because these have very complex material properties and we still don't really have a good understanding of those. However, oh, okay, here we go. All right, so however, uh, there have been some studies previously that have shown the importance of these soft tissues, uh, in particular sutures, but also the periodontal ligament in uh, dental research, and uh, fascia as well might have an importance in some uh, species. So just a couple of examples here. We've got um, uh, the Salvatore by Mark Jones that was uh, published last year, and this was looking at um, the chondrocranium and the sutures and really found that the sutures were quite important. They made big changes in the distribution and the magnitude of strain within the skull. But the chondrocranium didn't have so much of a, an impact. Uh, with the macaque skull uh, here on the, on, the other, um, on the left, we've got um, modelling of the temporal fascia. And as you can see here, on the side where the temporal fascia is actually modelled on the left, uh, it has a large reduction in the strain on that side. Um, this is for uh, tensile strain and then this is for compressive strain and it has a big difference for both of those. Uh, one reason for this might be because this was modelled so that the temporal fascia actually uh, completely um, uh, was completely uh, counteracting the downward pull of the masseter. So uh, they were kind of equaling out that force. So um, that could have just been a reason for that, or the, the results for that. Um, but we do still, of course, have that large force of the mass that are pulling down the zygomatic arch. And if we do have a temporal fascia there, it could, be, um, it could have a large effect to, to reduce that strain. Um, so the project that we've been working on is to try to investigate the role of these non-muscular soft tissues. So like I said, they may have very uh, important mechanical functions, but we just really don't understand it. And we're looking at this in various species. So you may have seen uh, Hugo's talk, uh, poster yesterday, which was on um, the reptiles that we're looking at in this um, study. Uh, and these species have these frame-like skulls. Um, with lots of uh, bars and openings and extensive soft tissues that cover these openings. Um, and the poster that Hugo presented was on the quadratal jugal ligament uh, and also the palatal fascia. Today I'm going to be talking about one of the mammals that we've been looking at, which is the rat. And obviously these have very different skull structures, so they have a, um, a shell-like structure that uh, completely surrounds the brain and they have potentially less structural soft tissues. So they still have a temporal fascia, they have uh, the palatal fascia, um, but they don't have these extensive ligament type structures like you know, the quadratal jugal lig ligament. So um, one of the uh, objectives of this project as well was try to, to compare uh, the mechanical role in not only individual species, but across species and whether reptiles and mammals also had um, different or, or whether the soft tissues were more important in reptiles compared to mammals. 
So our workflow is quite important because as anyone who works with models understands that uh, it's rubbish in, rubbish out. So what we really are trying to do here is put in as much information as we can on these soft tissues and, uh, and get um, a, as much accurate information into those models. So what we do is we start with uh, the live animal and we get some kinematic data um, like um, bite force and uh, video. Uh, we CT, micro CT, the, the skulls, uh, both before and after introducing the iodine stain. Oh, oh there we go, sorry. Um, then we also dissect the specimens to get m uh, muscle information like physiological cross-sectional area, uh, muscle, so muscle architecture uh, and the attachment sites. Uh, then we use the... Uh, dynamic materials testing to try to get some material properties of those tissues. By stretching the fascia, um, we can then get a Young's modulus. Um, we also get material properties from the bone um, by using nano indentation, and we're getting material properties from not only the bone but also the suture sites as well. So we can try to get as much um, accurate material properties uh, and information into these models as possible. Um, from the CT scans, we start by making a couple of different types of models, segment out all of the bones and the different structures that we're looking at, and then we start by looking at, or start by making a uh, multi-body dynamics model. And then all of that information is fed into uh, the final finite element model to get the results for stress and strain. So the... Oh, videos aren't working, that's okay. Um, the multi-body dynamics model uh, is used to get um, more accurate muscle input data. So we're using inverse dynamics method as well as the dynamic geometric optimization method in Adams. What we put in here is oh, we use uh, the kinematics to move the model so that the jaw follows a motion path and then using that motion path the algorithm works out what activation and muscle force these muscles are using at various uh, times within the gape. Uh, we then export those muscle forces and action and muscle activation times into our finite element models to try to get uh, as accurate input data um, as possible. And we're constraining the uppermost um, muscle force um, from our dissections with the physiological cross-sectional area. Um, very importantly, our finite element models are extremely complex. So um, this is one of the reasons why using soft tissues is so difficult because it's very time consuming to make models with so many um, materials. Uh, so the, mater the models that we're using have all the sutures segmented as, accurately, as anatomically as accurately as possible. Uh, and this is the first time this has been done. A lot of other studies who, uh, that model the sutures model more simplistic sutures or only model some of them, um, like perhaps only the facial sutures rather than the whole cranial facial sutures. We also have the different material properties for the bone, um, so cortical bone and trabecular bone. We have the teeth separate with the pop cavity and the dentine and enamel as well, and then we have the periodontal ligament surrounding the whole tooth. Uh, the jaw itself is modelled just as one, uh, one element because we're not getting results for stress and strain within the jaw. We're only looking at the And then we can also add some other, material prop uh, other materials in here as well. So we can add the endocast, um, which is not shown in here. It's, 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 um, through, through. Uh, we can add um, the eyes, and we can even add an entirely encompassing soft tissue around the whole thing and it puts skin on that as well. We're not at that stage um, just yet. So what we're looking at mostly and what I'll be discussing today is the function of the sutures and then the, uh, the fascia and ligaments over the top of that. Um, so some results. Um, I'm gonna focus on just the incisor biting. Uh, we did model incisor biting as well as molar biting along the tooth row, um, but just in the interest of time, I'll just focus on the incisors. So we've got a model here with no soft tissues, so no sutures, uh, no soft tissues, and this is more like models that are used in comparative studies, um, which are the, this is our most simple model. We then have a model with the sutures and the periodontal ligaments, and then finally on the left here we have the same model with the sutures, the periodontal ligament, fascia, and ligaments. 
Um, and on the top here, we have tension. So uh, where you see the red or the warm colors uh, and the gray, they are areas of high tension. Uh, and then you have compression at the bottom um, and it's the reverse kind of colors. So you get higher compression uh, in areas with the gray and uh, the blue. So what we mostly see, the biggest, the biggest uh, difference is seen when we add the sutures. Uh, and particularly on the ventral surface in the palate area. So with the addition of sutures, what we're doing is creating areas of mobility and then the whole skull becomes more mobile, more flexible. You get more distortion and you get higher strain. You're getting higher strain uh, magnitudes, you're also getting higher and different distributions. So we're getting slightly uh, more strain in some areas um, and we're getting uh, more strain generally over the entire skull. When we add the fascia and the ligaments, so this is the temporal fascia and the uh, post-orbital ligament that we've added here, what we get is a reduction in that downward pull of the zygomatic arch, just like we saw in the, the, um, uh, the macaque at the start. So we get a reduction in tension at the front of the zygomatic arch, and we're also getting a reduction in compression uh, at, on the uh, dorsal surface in the middle of um, the zygomatic arch. So it's... I mean, the zygomatic arch is acting as a beam being pulled downwards, and that temporal fascia is preventing some of that. What's interesting is that we're also getting this increase in tension uh, just on the temporal surface. So, um, and this might be because with the downward pull of the zygomatic arch, um, that is then, of course, attached to the cranium with the temporalis muscle. Uh, and that could then be pulling on this part of the skull as well. We have to look into that a little bit more because we're still also getting an increase in compression here as well. Um, so that we, think we still need to look into that. Um, we can also have a look at these results um, in comparison to some in vivo results. So these are not, uh, these are not results we've collected ourselves. Um, these are from a paper in 2007 on the rat and uh, what we have here is three areas where strain gauges have been placed on the skull and what I've done here is collected the same area uh, uh, and got an average of the elements, uh, the strain in the elements on the, in the same areas with no soft tissues and with the sutures and with the fascia and this is the in vivo results here. So we've got the uh, the infrafrontal suture, the sagittal suture, and the parietal bone. Um, and what we can see is that when there's no soft tissues at all, um, the model is much stiffer, so we're getting lower strain. Um, when, we're having, uh, when we're adding the sutures, of course, we're getting more, uh, well, higher strain values. These are softer materials, they're uh, deforming more. Um, and as you can see here, there's not that much of a difference between areas that are just in the middle of the bone. So right in the middle of the uh, parietal bone, there's not that much of a difference, but we're getting huge differences where those sutures are. Uh, but most importantly, what we see is that when we do include the sutures, uh, the results are closer to the in vivo results than without soft tissues. So this is... So this is indicating that um, our models that don't include enough soft tissues might not be giving us the best results that we can get. Uh, and of course, this is um, relevant to the questions that we're asking as well. Okay, so um, just some of the conclusions so far and to wrap this up. Um, the sutures are important and they do increase um, strain overall uh, as well as um, change the distribution during feeding. Um, so there are these local differences and it's not just an even distribution of strain over the entire skull. The strain is um, changing magnitude and distribution. Um, so they are because they are areas of these greater mobility, um, they may actually also reduce strain in the actual bone by um, providing some areas uh, that are um, Having, with larger um, distortion. Um, the temporal fascia may be important in um, reducing some of the strain in the zygomatic arch, 
Uh, however, it also increases this tension over the temporal region, which we're not really sure about quite yet, and we'll have to look into this um, and perhaps change some of our analyses and see what's happening there. Um, and including sutures seems to increase the accuracy of the model um, compared to the model with no sutures. But I think what's most important to mention here is that even with our models that uh, don't include sutures, if we're using those as comparative, in comparative studies, even comparative studies with fossils, um, it's important that we understand that sutures might actually be altering our interpretation of those results. So we often interpret results with, you know, if it's got um, high strain, uh, high, high stress, then it is um, perhaps a, uh, a soft uh, food eater or something. Or, or we're, we're, making, um, um, uh, we're making conclusions about their ecology based on the stress and strain in the model. However, if we're making comparisons in, uh, over different species that have different uh, levels of fusion in the sutures, uh, different numbers of sutures, or even between things like reptiles and mammals, we could be completely changing our uh, interpretation. So I think that uh, it's important that the sutures are included um, even in comparative studies where, it's, um, where we're not trying to actually get accurate, uh, uh, accurate um, numbers for, com uh, for comparing with in vivo, even if it's just a comparative study. I think they are important because they could, con uh, could change our conclusions. Uh, and with that, um, just thank the co-authors again and the institutes that are involved. Thank you.